Someone once described God as a God who can't stop speaking, and maybe that's right for them. But I think for many of us, especially in our most desperate moments and our most desperate prayers, we experience something other than that, something less than that. What I received back from that desperation was nothing. What do we do when shouting into the ether or begging for relief up into the sky? The only thing we get back is the echo of our own voices. I feel alone. I feel like there's an absence that is, it's an absence that's so absent it feels present in its absence. The Silence of God, today on Don't Hold Me To This. I'm I'm tempted to start rather academically, maybe as a yeah. as a kind of ongoing effort to avoid yeah. talking about it. Um, um, I have a sense of what I mean when I talk about the silence of God, um, but I am interested to know what what it is you mean, and and I I mean that both from a kind of um academic perspective what is it that we're talking about when we're talking about the science of god but also from a kind of experiential perspective um so what is it that you mean well i mean i think i i don't know what i want to want i don't know what i'd want to say academically yeah um, I know what I want to, but I have some at least thoughts about what I want to say about about it experientially. Mm -hmm. um, and so, experientially, when I think about the silence of God, I think about um, the moments of my own life, whether it was. You know, I can think of, you know, teenage and young adult angst about just what I was going to do with my life and whether the girl I was in love with was going to reciprocate and, um, and, um, and I had been, you know, raised in a, in a, in the faith with the notion that we'll, you know, we, we believe in a God and we, you know, we follow a God who is invested in those outcomes as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I can remember you know, begging God for mm -hmm. some sort of sign or answer clarity mm -hmm. um, as I was searching with, with, I, you know, maybe, you know, we can step back from this and maybe critique uh, the maturity of my questions and all of that. But but there was no, there was still, as a father, um, as a child would come to his father and ask for bread. Mm -hmm. That's what I was doing. Right. Like God, what what I, I really want to do? What's right here, and I I want to. I want to do what you want me to do. And I, I want to, um, and so when I think about the science of God in those moments, it's, it's, there is no, there is no, the only, there is no feedback. Mm -hmm. the, the truth is there is no feedback. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can, I can argue, I, I could, I can argue that there was feedback, but, but the only reason I, I say that is because I'm interpreting signals out in the world as if they're feedback from God. And I'm doing that on no assurance that I'm reading the signals, right. That, that, that that's true or not true, or that's what God wants me to do or doesn't want me to do. Right. I'm just projecting that onto the signals that I'm receiving. And it's sort of shot through with guesswork, right? It's yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and yes. Um, and, and so there's those, and then there's the, you know, the, the, the deepest, most desperate moments of, 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 um, 
for me, after a, after the accident, after a, you know, huge traumatic event where I remember saying to somebody who was giving me right theology, mm. there's nothing, there wasn't, was, what they were saying was true um, within a particular kind of field of discussion. But I remember saying, I don't tell me the math. I don't need the math. I need God to show up. Yeah. And in those moments, what I was left with was, uh, I, I want to say it again, what, what, I, what, I, what I received back from that desperation was nothing. Mm -hmm. Silence. Um, not nothing, like big and nothing, maybe we could say. You know, we can, I can, I can come back around on the other side of it and um, we could, and we're going to do this, right? We're going to come back on around on the other side of this and say that the nothing isn't a, isn't a nothing, nothing, but it's a, there is a nothingness to it. There's a real silence to it. Um, and, um, and so for me, it's that, it's that. So like in that most desperate um, place, um, where everything feels shattered, and you're looking for a lifeline. Um, there doesn't seem to be one. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the existential part of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to, I don't think I'd want to talk about the theological part of it because I think then I, I feel like if I do that, I take away from the real impact of the existential part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, or at least that's what that's what I'm tempted to do. I, I'm tempted to start framing it in different ways and explaining away what I what I what I really feel. Yeah. Um, and so I think if we're going to talk about the silence of God, then we we've, we've got to um, frame it in in the in that um, that place of desperation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's really easy to paper over the des desperation of that cry of yeah. Jesus on the cross. Yeah, I mean, I, I think from an academic perspective, what I mean is to say a, a, a kind of cursory survey of the of the biblical story shows, right. shows God responding verbally speaking in ways right. that, that people can hear and understand. Not everyone, right? The voice on the Mount of Transfiguration was, was um, audible and understandable, uh, but the voice that comes from Mount Sinai is a blast of trumpet horn that only some people can understand, right? Um, yeah. Some yeah. people at the, the, the conversion of Saul to Paul, um, he heard a voice. Everybody else thought it was a clap of thunder, right? So, right. not always in everyone, but enough. It happens. To, you're right. Enough right. here. It makes sense to talk about God as a God who speaks. You know? Yeah, and so I think then academically, when you say it that way, I think one of the things that then it, we're tempted to do is, um, it'd be sort of maybe 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 it's not sort of like it's exactly like you know you you follow the monk around. You know, and every time he speaks, you write down what he speaks, and then people get the book of what the monk says, yeah. and they think that all the monk did was talk, talk, That's right. right? Yeah, yeah. And so I think part of the academics of this is is recognizing that we we know what we know of the of of God, at least in part. Um. We, we we only know it within the confines of 
what was written down about the things that he said. Right. Even his own son is is described to us as this as it and it, uh, the, the word made human. Right. Even that is it, that that is framed. The incarnation is framed in the in the um, in the image of of sp- speaking. Yes. You know, now God has spoken in his son. Right. And so we, so the, the Bible does tell us about a lot of silence from God, but I think we have, we have taken the fact that, that um, we do get to know some of the things that he says and that we know him through those things, that that's sort of the order of the day um, is, and the ex and, and the rightful expectation. Well, and right, and that, so, so that's, the, that's the that sort of like bridges the gap between the academic description of what we're talking about and the, our kind of experience. Right. God in the biblical story speaks enough for us to not be wrong to think about Him as a God who speaks. Right. Um, so that when we pray out of desperation like you were talking about in high school or me in the minivan broken down after fourth of july already trying to get my family home um when we pray out of desperation and what we get back is something that doesn't amount to speaking um (laughs) Right. What we get back is a kind of a, a, a kind of hollowness and emptiness and nothingness that you um, that you just talked about that that silence which is the absence of sound that silence which is feels like the absence of God. Um, I don't think we're wrong to to f- feel it in that way. Um, if there's anything that we can say for certain from the sweep of the biblical story is that um, God is uninterested in our defending of him, of our making excuses for him. When, um, when it feels like he doesn't come through. And I, and I think if, if what we've said academically about what we can know about God through the stories that we have written down, um, then then we can, I don't think we're wrong to say there are times when he doesn't speak. There are times when we speak into the, into the ether and the only thing we get back is a, an echo of our own voice. Um, which is emphatically not helpful, right? It's just not I, like the the reason we're praying out of desperation is that we've come to the sort of end of our resources, at least so far as we can tell. I cannot physically push this minivan full of my family the two miles home. I can't do it. There's no tow truck company open at this time of night. Uh, and we couldn't all fit into that tow truck anyway. Um, uh we've come to the end of our resources, which is why we're, I think is what we mean when we're praying out of desperation. And so that's that a kind of inflection moment where it's become totally obvious that if something good is going to happen, it's going to be because God does it, not because I did, because I don't have anything. I've got no leverage, right? I've got nothing to, to, to pull here. And um, I remember sitting in the van, um, just silently, to myself praying that what felt like an impossible prayer god i know you can i know you can fix this please just fix it so i can get my family and uh put my foot on the brake and push the little button to 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 start the car and and nothing happened and i like here's what's echoing my head right now all of the kind of voices that I think, I, I think are still making effort to defend God, to make excuses for God. Um, all of those voices saying, 
Well, you should just be grateful that you had a van to break down. <laughs> right? But you eventually got home, so you're fine. Um, and I and I and I wonder if what's happening, and I, I I'll stop because I want to hear you reflect on it. I wonder if what's happening is those voices are speaking up because they're actually uncomfortable identifying the silence as just genuine silence. If God is a God who speaks, and out of our desperation, we pray for help that only he can get, and what we get back is not speaking, not an answer, um, then I think it's okay to say it, he was silent. And then just to just to let that do its thing for a moment. I don't even, that's not even the right language. Just to let that be the way it is. Uh, and then, and then come and talk about it on a podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I do. So I, yes, I mean, that's exactly where I was going to go. I don't think people are primarily defending God. Well, and those are voices are my, yeah, yeah. I'm only accusing myself. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, I think what they're doing is assuaging their own discomfort. Yeah. With the, with the, the incongruity of whatever the situation is. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and we've been convinced for whatever reasons, various reasons, um, that, a, a couple of things I think that 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 make us uncomfortable with the incongruity of our desperate pleas and just acknowledging that God is silent. Um, one is that uh, kind of going back to the academic part of the discussion is there are at least a large number of voices who communicate intentionally or not that if 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 you're not hearing him, then the problem's on your end, yeah. right? Um, so that's, you know, uh, and so that leaves the person who's experience, experiencing the silence of God going, well, what's, what's wrong with me? You know, oh, the problem's here. Those, you know, whatever you want to call them, the dark nights of the soul or the silence of God, these moments where um, where we um, we're, we're looking for that um, that very tangible connection. Um, out of our desperation, you know, there, those those moments that and, and that nothing comes back. Those moments um, they leave they leave us um, they leave us in a kind of uncertainty with what's on the other side of silence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and that's especially if you're you know we, we you know i'm a you know, i'm i'm in i believe i, I believe in god I, uh, I believe he exists i believe he loves me um but I, but to to then reach out for that and come up with air um is is troubling it's it's hard to know how to um then calibrate myself in relationship to the god that i say i know and knows me and loves me yeah. um and so i think i think we look for other ways of explaining that um but it's not again i don't think it's to defend god i think it i think it opens up the possibility of of things that we're afraid to to really um, encounter. I was um, a, I was an extra in um, the Julia Roberts film in the '90s, Pelican Brief. Do you remember that movie? 
<laughs> of course I do. <clears throat> Uh, my my best friend's mom was like a casting director. I was on the team of the casting director, and so my best friend and I were in. How do I not know this? <laughs> I don't know. This is fun. It's, it's going to be disappointing, just like the rest of this. Oh. So just yeah, hold on to your seat. Um, <laughs> so we, we went down to New Orleans for like I was probably a week and a half or two weeks every day. We got down there at, at you know seven a.m. Um, we're in this huge corral with a tent over it of full of you know, hundreds of extras that were in that were supposed to be like all the the crowd in 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 downtown new orleans uh, it was french quarter i don't remember exactly where it was and um i remember seeing julia roberts in a in a, a golf cart zoom by but she was way over there but i saw her in real life so not just on the screen i saw her like but she was pretty far away not not close enough to talk to um and uh, I remember every day that like we'd all get into our places and then the, the director would say uh, um, he would say like movement or something and what he meant was for all the extras to start just kind of being normal crowd people, sitting yeah. At, yeah walking up some stairs sitting at a cafe whatever and we were walking past the place where where uh, Julie Roberts was talking to I don't remember who the who the other uh, main character was in the movie um, and, I think this is the guy that she was her law professor that gets not the spoiler anybody but he gets killed. You, uh, what? Yeah. If I remember, if I remember this the scene correctly, you know the you know story better than I do. And uh, we were in between the camera and the conversation that the camera was captured, um, and so had a like a a uh, a very high chance of being on screen and uh i remember waiting with like real anticipation for when this movie came out so i could be like look i'm on this screen and um i was wearing like a gray shirt and my friend was wearing a deer sucker suit <laughs> when i was in high school so i didn't have any uh, uh, my friend was wearing a, a like a blue and white rugby shirt which were so popular uh, at that time mm -hmm. i remember sitting in the theater uh, and here comes our screen, and across the screen walks a blue and white rugby shirt. And there's clearly somebody on the other side of that blue and white rugby shirt. And I know it was me, but you couldn't see a square centimeter of my body. Uh, so I was, oh, right there. No. I was right there and uh, didn't make it in. And I think, n not to turn it to maybe we've already turned too serious a, a corner here but i think for me the fear is um like we said there are times where god speaks and people to whom god speaks and there are times when god doesn't speak and very likely lots of people to whom god doesn't speak if, if you think about the 400 years of 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 kind of multi-generational silence between the old testament and the new testament there were generations of people that never heard from god and when we hear god speaking in in early in the story of the old testament for example he's always talking to moses or aaron or whatever but he's not talking to israel generally right and i think the fear for me is I'm an extra in the story of the world and I don't mm. have a speaking part and I, and I can see the main character from really far off, but I, I won't ever actually talk to the main character and I won't make it on this. I won't even make it on the screen. Um, I, I don't have yeah. a contribution worthy enough to make it in, into the story um, that I'm an extra. Uh, in 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 the story of the world, and in some ways that it, it, in the same way an extra kind of in my in the story of my own life. Um, when the film is cut, my parts end up on the cutting room floor. I'm edited out over and over and over again. Um, and uh, and as much as I joke about it, like it's it's genuinely after my minivan broke down and um, and I prayed that desperate prayer that I actually really believe God would answer. Like I, when I pushed that start button, I really thought like, it's going to work. 
because this is what God wants. And it didn't work. And I remember reflecting on that for weeks afterward, um, thinking about that feeling of being an extra that doesn't even make it on the screen. Uh, so which which is a, is a different, it's a different kind of fear, but it's similar, right? Which is, it's not that God is villain, it's that, it's that, you know, you're, you just have no part in what he's really up to. Yeah, maybe one way to say it is that not that God is silent, but he's silent to me. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, you're... Yeah, and that, that totally makes sense. And I, we, we've certainly... I've had that uh, similar kind of fear of, like, somehow we're off the map. Like, you know, we, we, we found ourselves in a situation where we we're we're not not we're off we're off like I said off the map and and how, how do we how do we get back? Um yeah those that's um yeah so that just makes me that just make all of this makes me again <clears throat> if if we're if we're thinking about it from what what fears it touches on in us, it makes me wonder. Mm. I, I certainly have boldly projected this out to say already that I think we, people are generally, a, are responding in these moments because of our own fears. But I wonder, if, yeah, I hear that story and it just makes me wonder what, how that hits broadly right um in terms of other people feeling that kind of uh, fear that that your parts are on the cutting room floor yeah yeah, yeah i mean I, I i am i'm happy to uh conclude that it's just me <laughs> I'm the only one that feels that way, and and like again, I hear. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be happy with that. I, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I. Well, and and the voice that turns in my head, which is again, a, 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 I think a voice that wants to to quickly move past the feelings of silence, of uh, absence, of insignificance. Um, the voice says, "Like, well, why? Who? Like." Why do you, why would you think you have anything to contribute anyway? Like, why do you think that God would uh, take time to speak to you? Like, how arrogant, you know what I mean? Uh, and, 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 and again, I think that is a kind of assuaging of that feeling of lostness, of, of aloneness and of absence. But it is also, I think, a kind of, making excuses like trying to explain like show like show the math like you said earlier um uh and what i want to say is um and this is don't hold me to this um like i i'm afraid to say this on recording so i have my eyes closed so if i can't see you you can't see me um, I'm going to say it and then we'll clean it up. Don't hold me to this. I, I, I felt myself thinking writing for today and thinking about our conversation today that I hope that I'm a better dad to my kids than God has been to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because what I, I it's, it's, it's interesting you say that because my my response when you asked the rhetorical question was, well, why do you describe yourself as father? Then damn it, yes, it's, right. But if, if if I'm supposed to if I'm supposed to see myself as insignificant, 
compared to you know the grandeur and wisdom and omnipotence and then why have you why have you why do we give you the why do we you have the label father yeah um and why does jesus give us i, I mean i keep going back to it but i feel like that but his metaphor is of course, when you ask your father for bread, he's he's going to give you bread and not a stone. Oh, yeah. Of course, of course, he wants to get he wants to give you bread because he's your father. Yeah. So, um, I I don't think I, I'm I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I um I I feel the impact of of what you just said yeah um and i i don't think it's uh i don't think it needs to be apologized for because i think it's it's honest and it's um and it's something that um i think part of the des when we talk about these desperate moments however you might describe it you described it as i hope i'm a better father to my kids than um than god has been to me and, um, at least I, I i don't know if you'd qualify it but i i don't think you would i, I know you want to i don't I know that's not a totalizing statement um about god's um, but um but i do think that's part of the desperation of those moments yeah is because we want God to be what we believe Him to be, and we have a certain frame of mind. Right, um, and it's—I mean, it, it. You know, I, I can't help but think about. You know, you know, people with, you know, dealing with the. Family member with a terminal illness and just yeah, so much desperation from him to his wife and kids to a town that loves him yeah loves him um, and desperately we want his healing and. And of course, a good father would too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't know what else we can say than than that. Right. Um, and so that's that's painful. I, I think the reason Shane and I say it the way I say it is is that it's once I run down the all of the kind of like standard responses um, that just, they don't, they totally feel inadequate. Like one response is, well, um, God is, um, God is not really like exhaustively in control of everything. Um, and so, right. so he, yeah, he wants, he wants, what's best for his kids but the world is turning the way it's turning and people are making decisions and he's just not he's not in control of it in the way that it would take for him to answer the prayer in the way that you thought and it just feels like yeah that's that can't be right because <laughs> if you look at like look at the way some of the stories in the in the in the bible unfold um in order for them to unfold in that way god has to be pretty much in total control i don't mean as a puppet and i don't know exactly how to square that circle but you know what i mean that answer just feels like it falls flat right he obviously can interject obviously he, right you, I mean, that's right he can speak into right and he can he can change uh the, the very the very uh he can insert himself into the plot line and yeah have it go a different direction right um and so, and so if i can if i can if i can hear those objections that sort of like 
dissection of what must be going on in in my head. He has some. He has something. He's trying to teach you. He's he's not right. right. He's not being silent. He's got some greater good that he's working on. Right. You know, out out of out of your knowledge. Yeah, um, is another common way of filling in the gap. That's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> and there's any number of those, and all of them feel to me like they fall flat. And when you get to the end of all of those. I think what you're left with is the um, is the incongruency of these two things that are true. God loves the world. He made it and he gave himself for it. And he's often silent in it. And that's that's the end of the sentence, right? Um, it, it, it seems to me at this point. Um, and so I think what you have to say in that space, uh, fully accounting for both of those things is all the things that we're saying. And it sure feels quiet down here. Right? Like I feel alone. I feel like there's an absence that is... It's an absence that's so absent, it feels present in its absence. That its absence is heavy, it's so absent. Um, and, I, and I think we're almost compelled to say that. Yeah. I mean, my brain's running ahead a bit, but um, I do think that what's in front of us, you know, here is um, is I, I don't I don't I, I kind of want to put it as a question, um, you know. It, um, you know, is <clears throat> maybe this maybe this already shifts it out of what you just mm -hmm. said, and so I'm trying to hold it. Mm -hmm. um, um, <clears throat> But I guess what I what I what I what I, what I ask is can can we then say is um, this that the silence it, it is the point. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like if I do that, then it's automatically it, it's setting it up to already tip into something else and instead of allowing the silence to be what it is, which is what you just said is that we we want to we. There's something here that we need to embrace, and it's the incongruence of a God who loves us, is our Father, does give us bread and and fish and life and healing and cares about the world, and who um, is often silent and may and I think I want to say more often than not is silent. I think on, on you know the Again, back to the academic side of this, in the totality of the history of humanity, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's crazy to say that God doesn't speak more than He does speak. Right, uh, and that that in itself is something that to be to live by faith. We just have to embrace. Um, I, I, this may be this is maybe a little different, but I think it comes to mind. I've told this story before, mm -hmm. but you know, 
uh, after the accident, one of the things that, um, one of the images that came to mind to describe what I was feeling was that <laughs> um, God had sort of grabbed me up by my shirt collar and had, had pulled me into this, this deep, deep, dark forest. Um, um, and, and in this process of sort of being dragged into this place, this, so darkness, I think includes what we're describing as silence, right? This, um, and, you know, my, 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 my bag of answers, my little backpack that, that I, you know, I, that I'm, I'm packed for this journey um, that, that I want desperately to, to, to pull out and help me navigate this new space. Um, not, not only does, not, God doesn't tell me it, I can't bring it. It can't come. Mm. Like, like there's something that, that, that this place that I've been brought to that, it can't, it can't come into the, to the weight of this moment. It just, it can't come with me. And, um, and what I felt in that, in that experience of wrestling with me in that space and God who, who, um, at, at least metaphorically in my in my imagery of it has brought me here um that uh i i i felt like my what what was set before me was the question can you be okay mm -hmm. with me here right and so um, your, you know, your bag of tricks, your bag of answers for being okay with me, that can't come to this place. Right. Um, this place, you have to deal with this question on, on a level that's frightening, um, it, uncertain, it's um, painful. Um, but the question was can you can you be okay with me here? And I feel like you've described something similar with the silence of God, right? Is can you can can we can our, can you know is our relationship gonna can we survive this? Yeah. Um, and and what did you say? Um, Um, I mean, you know, the, the truth is, is that, um, my answer is, was, and is that because of the resurrection of Jesus, yes. So in some ways my form, my math came with me, right? But it, sure. it, it, but it was, um, but that's all that it, it was certainly reduced down to. I don't know how to make sense of anything else of, of this right now. So what I'm banking on is that what the resurrection says is true is true, even here. Um, and um, so it wasn't a worked out theology of, of, of the science of God or any of this stuff. It was just like, Um, I'm I'm so desperate mm -hmm. and so broken that um, the only possible lifeline I can imagine is is God incarnate, crucified, and raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, nothing nothing else. 
um, it, I don't, I don't want to say nothing else mattered. That's not right. Um, nothing else had the gravity to enter that space um, for me. I think the other, yeah. Another image I had that I wrestled with was, and I think it's, you know, that image where Luke is with Yoda on, what is it, Tatooine or? No, no, they're on Dagobah. Dagobah, yeah, the, uh, the Dagobah system. Dagobah, yeah. Um, and Luke, you know, senses the cave. Yep. And he he starts to take his lightsaber, and Yoda says, "You're not gonna, you're not gonna need that." And Luke says, "What's in there?" And Luke says, "Only what you take with you." Yeah. And I. And so part of what I've been unpacking um, with that, this notion of you know, God's si silence is um, I, th I go back to that and think that, that in that moment, the same thing was, you know, what's in that dark cave? Um, in some sense, it's only what you take with you and that and i don't mean to say that to deny that god is real or anything like that i'm, I'm not that's not my my point my point is that um what's being what's being surfaced uh in that is what you bring what you bring into the mm -hmm. into that place with you um and and so for me, the, that's why I think the answer was um, it, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't you know, justification by faith alone or any of that other stuff. It's just very basic. Gee, God has become incarnate. Yeah has been crucified and has been raised from the dead. Um, and some sense I, I and in in that has has uh, not just overcome the darkness, but for me it wasn't just that, it was that there's solidarity in in the experience of it. Yeah, the the sort of mystery of um God becoming one of us is that God in some way experiences the silence of God. Um, God knows what it's like for God to be absent. Right. Um, and if we take the Jesus's cries during his crucifixion seriously, then um, we know we can at least say that. Right. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize, like, what you don't have is is Rabbi Jesus sort of doing a lesson on how it only feels like God is absent, really absent for all of these reasons. <laughs> you know what I mean? He just says the thing. Um, uh, he uh, He names that space between... Um, God's love for and commitment to the world on the one side and God's silence on the other. He names that space and doesn't try to fill it full of bandages that cover over the woundedness that you experience in that space. Names it. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're left with. I, again, I think maybe this, and maybe this is me teasing out my own image, my own sense of it. Is we're left with the answer is the thing itself. Mm -hmm. That's the answer, right? Is um, or we could say it, you know, in terms of what you were saying. The answer is Jesus Himself. He doesn't answer. He doesn't fill in the. He doesn't fill in the. The gaps are filled in by. Jesus, are you, you know, and so the incongruence is uh, alleviated 
it's just um, what I want to say is it's person. It's just personified, and we just become followers of at least from our human perspective, uh, uh, we become followers of and embracers of a of an incongruence and um and that's why i think that question of can you be okay with me here is seems felt really important for me to wrestle with which was because the truth was before that event was, the answer was no i want to i want a god i can explain yeah. and understand and um and uh, i want to you know i want to be able to um, then turn around and and you know explain explain him to others and and make this something that i can can uh manage and um and there's there's these kinds of experiences put us in this place of realizing that um, what we have is what's in front of us. And um, and what are we going to do with that? What, what is it? What does it mean to live? with that um i mean that's the question um uh, i think that there's it's it's a it's maybe in some way a trading um trading the ease of a god that we can talk about for the difficulty of a god that we live with um, yeah, that's a, I mean, that's very well said. And that's uh, it, it. It feels like it would go on a T-shirt or something, but um, because <laughs> I don't know everything that means. Um, but it's certainly, it's certainly the harder path, the 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 more uncertain path, the path with a lot more fog across the walkway, uh, where you can't really see very distant into the future. Um, You'd know how it ends. We know how the story ends. Yeah, and I think in some ways, honestly, Shaner, it's 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 um, it goes back to the a, a couple of episodes ago where we recognize the there is a there is an improvisational necessity to a life of faith. There is a it's not just one way of doing it, but it's the only way of doing. It. Of figuring it out as we go, um, because the the future is not open to us. It is foggy, um, and it is all of the contours of a of a life of a relationship rather than a life of a kind of academic description. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I think of, you know, Mary Oliver's phrase, you know, wild, wild and precious. I, I, in some ways, that's what we're describing. It's something that's the incongruency of something being both wild and uncontrollable and mysterious, but also precious. And, right. Um, and, and, and the question is, um, can we be okay with that? And I think the answer for me is, and I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. My answer to it is, uh, I, I don't know about being okay with it, but but I'm willing to allow the impact of that question to do its work. Whatever, um, huh? Whatever that is. Yeah, but and this is where you know we you know, I, this this is a this is a whole again a whole other podcast. But I, you know, I do think about um, <laughs> Jacob wrestling with God. It's like he was. I think in that moment we could say he he was confronted with that question: Can you be okay with this? And in one sense, he was like, 
I may be, but you're you're gonna bless me before this is over, right? I'm not letting go mm -hmm. until you until you show yourself my father. Um, and so maybe maybe, and that's why I don't want to say I'm okay with it. What I want to say is, um, the questions in front of me, and now now we grapple. Um, now we wrestle mm -hmm. and um, and not to be not to not to be glib about how profound the, the question is but I, I do find myself in a like I could have never I couldn't have ever even just said what I just said yeah before this experience that Okay, and now we now we wrestle, right? I mean, I'm talking about God. It seems so um, so disrespectful and unpresbyterian. <laughs> uh, and and but I say, I say that and and it and that actually gives me a sense I, I, that that draws a, something of a sense of joy in me to be able to say out loud that that our encounter with God um, is in the question can you be okay with me here includes the, the option of rolling up my sleeves and saying we're going to wrestle this out and I'm not letting you go until you yeah, until you bless me, um, and that at least helps me then to be okay in that space, right? Yeah. That to know that I'm not just that, that we're not that that our posture isn't simply to go, Uncle, you're God. You know, I you win, I lose. Um, Kind of an unfair fight, anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. What? What? Yeah. Okay. So you got me. Yeah. Right. It's, um, you know, there's no, and and so the 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 story of uh, Jacob, um, and I, I don't, I, I think this certainly extends beyond Jacob, but I think the scriptures are shot through with the story of Jacob, um, and. So I, I at least can begin to conceive of a way of being okay in, in that moment. Don't Hold Me To This podcast is a production of Don't Hold Me To This. You can find out more do some more reading and get in touch at don'tholdmetothis.com. No apostrophe.